Hi guys, welcome to Storytime for Adults. Uh, my name is Patrick. I'm from the Adult Services Department here at the Joliet Public Library. Um, and we are going to be doing some story time. So I hope you guys got your juice boxes and your blankets and cookies or whatever. Whatever they do in story time. You know, that works too. Some adult beverages can work in the place of choose boxes. So we're gonna do a few short stories. We'll see how much we have time for. I definitely wanted to do one from one of my favorite authors, Stephen King. Um, not your typical story time fair, I guess you would say, but really, really great author. I'm sure most, if not all of you are familiar with. So we'll start with him. Uh, he does kind of air on the scary side of his stories if you're not familiar with Stephen King. So which one are we going to do? I'll be reading a short story by Stephen King called The Fifth Quarter. All right, so The Fifth Quarter by Stephen King. I parked in the heap around the corner from Keenan's house, sat in the dark for a moment, then turned off the key and got out. When I slammed the door, I could hear rust flaking off the rocker panels and dropping onto the street. It was going to be like that much longer. The gun was in a holster and lay against my rib cage like a fist. It was Barney's 45, and I was glad of that. It lent the whole crazy business a touch of irony, maybe even a sense of justice. Keenan's house was an architectural monstrosity spread over a quarter acre of land, all slanting angles and steep slope roofs behind an iron fence. He'd left the gate unlocked as I'd hoped. Earlier I'd seen him calling someone from the living room and a hunch too strong to deny me, to deny told it me it had been either Jagger or the Sarge. Probably the Sarge. The waiting was over, this was my night. I walked to the driveway, staying close to the shrubbery and listening for any strange sound over the cutting line of the January wind. There wasn't any. It was Friday night, and Keenan's sleepin' maid would be out having a jolly time at somebody's Tupperware party. Nobody home but Keenan. Waiting for the Sarge. Waiting, although he didn't yet know it yet, for me. The carport was open and I slipped inside. The ebony shadow of Keenan's Impala loomed. I tried the back door. The car was also open. Keenan wasn't cut out to be a villain, I reflected. He was much too trusting. I got in the car, sat down, and waited. Now I could hear the faint sound of jazz in the wind, very quiet, very good. Miles Davis, maybe. Keenan listening to Miles Davis and holding a gin fizz in one manicured hand. Nice for him. It was a long wait. The hands on my watch crawled from 8.30 to 9 to 10. Time for a lot of thinking. I mostly thought about Barney, and that wasn't strictly a matter of choice. I thought about how he looked in that small boat when I found him, staring up at me and making meaningless cawing noises. He'd been adrift for two days and looked like a boiled lobster. There was black blood encrusted across his midsection where he'd been shot. He steered towards the cottage as best he could, but still it had been mostly luck. Lucky he'd gotten there. Lucky he could still talk for a little while. I had a fistful of sleeping pills ready if he couldn't talk. I didn't want him to suffer. Not unless there was a reason for it anyway. As it turned out, there was. He had a story to tell, a real whopper, and he told me almost all of it. When he was dead, I went back to the boat and got his 45. It was hidden aft in a small compartment wrapped in a waterproof pouch. Then I towed his boat out into deep water and sank it. If I could have put an epitaph over his head, it would have been the one about how there's a sucker born every minute. Most of them are pretty nice guys too, I bet, just like Barney. Instead, I started trying to find the men who capped him. It had taken six months to find Keenan and to ascertain that Sarge was at least somewhere close by. But I'm a persistent little pup, and here I was. At 10.20, headlights splashed up the curving driveway and I lay on the floor of the Impala. The newcomer, newcomer drove into the carport snuggling up close to Keenan's car. 
It sounded like one of the old Volkswagens. The little engine died and I could hear Sarge grunting softly as he fought his way out of the little car. The porch light went on and the sound of the door clicking open came to me. Sarge, you're late. Come on in and have a drink. Scotch. I'd unrolled the window before. Now I stuck Barney's 45 through it, holding the stock with both hands. Stand still, I said. The Sarge was halfway up the porch steps. Keenan, the perfect host, had come out and was looking down at him, waiting for him to come up so he could, a so he could after you him into the house. They were both perfect silhouettes and the light spilling from inside. I doubted if they could see much of me in the dark, but they could see the gun. It was a big gun. Who are you? Keenan asked. Jerry Tarkinen, I said. Move and I'll put a hole in you big enough to watch television through. You sound like a punk, Sarge said. He didn't move, though. Just don't move. That's all you got to worry about. I opened the Impala's back door and got out carefully. The Sarge was staring at me over his shoulder and I could see the glitter of his little eyes. One hand was creeping up the label of his 1943 model double-breasted suit. Oh, please, I said. Get your hands up. The Sarge put his hands up. Keenan's already were. Come down to the foot of the steps, both of you. They came down, and out of the direct glare of the light, I could see their faces. Keenan looked scared, but the Sarge might have been listening to a lecture on Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. He was probably the one who had job Barney. Face the wall and lean on it, both of you. If you're after money, I laughed. Well, I was going to start off by offering you a cut rate deal on Tupperware, work my way up to the big stuff gradually, but you saw through me. Yeah, I'm after money. $480,000, actually. Buried on a little island off Bar Harbor called Carmen's Folly. Keenan jerked as if he'd been shot, but the Sarge's dipped in concrete face never twitched. He turned around and put his hands on the wall, leaning his weight on them. Keenan reluctantly followed suit. I frisked him first and got a stupid little 32 with a three inch barrel. A gun like that, you could put the muzzle against the guy's head and still miss when you pulled the trigger. I threw it over my shoulder and heard it bounce off one of the cars. Sarge was clean, and it was a relief to step away from him. We're going into the house. You first, Keenan, then Sarge, then me, without incident, okay? We all trooped up the steps and into the kitchen. It was one of those germless chrome and tile jobs that looked like it was spit out of some mass production womb in the Midwest somewhere. The work of hardy Methodists who all look like Mr. Goodwrench and smell like cherry blend tobacco. I doubt if it ever needed anything so vulgar as cleaning. Keenan probably just closed the doors and turned on the hidden sprinklers once a week. I paraded them through into the living room, another treat for the eyes. It had, been, it had apparently been done by a decorator who never got over his crush on Ernest Hemingway. There was a flagstone fireplace almost as big as an elevator car, a teak buffet table with a moose head mounted above it, and a drinks cart stashed below the gun rack, loaded with premium artillery. The stereo had turned itself off. I waved the gun at the couch, one on each end. They sat, Keenan on the right, Sarge on the left. The Sarge looked even bigger sitting down. An ugly, dented scar twisted its way through his slightly overgrown crew cut. I put his weight at about 230 and wondered why a man with the size and physical presence of Mike Tyson owned a Volkswagen. I grabbed an easy chair and dragged it over to Keenan's quicksand colored rug until it was in front and between them. I sat down and let the 45 rest on my thigh. Keenan stared at it like a bird stares at a snake. The Sarge, on the other hand, was staring at me like he, like he was the snake and I was the bird. Now what, he asked. Let's talk about maps and money, I said. I don't know what you're talking about, Sarge said. All I know is that little boys shouldn't play with guns. How's Cappy McFarland doing these days, I asked casually. I didn't get anything from the Sarge, but Keenan popped his cork. He knows, he knows. The word shot out of him like bullets. Shut up, the Sarge told him. Shut up, shut your trap. Keenan moaned a little. This was one part of the scenario he had never imagined. I smiled. He's right, Sarge, I said. I know, almost all of it. Who are you? No one you know, a friend of Barney's. Barney who? Sarge asked indifferently. Barney Google with a goo goo googly eyes? He wasn't dead, Sarge. Not quite dead. Sarge turned a slow and murderous look on Keenan. Keenan shuddered and opened his mouth. Don't talk, Sarge said to him. Not one word. I'll snap your neck like a chicken if you do. Keenan's mouth shut with a snap. 
Sarge looked at me again. What does almost all of it mean? Everything but the fine details. I know about the armored car, the island, Cappy McFarlane, how you and Keenan and some, how you and Keenan and someone named Jagger killed Barney, and the map. I know about that. It wasn't the way he told you, Sarge said. He was going to cross us. He couldn't cross the street, I said. He was just a patsy who could drive. He shrugged. It was like watching a minor earthquake. Okay, be as dumb as you look. I knew Barney had something on as early as last March. I just didn't know what. And then one night he had a gun, this gun. How did you connect with him, Sarge? A mutual friend, someone who did time with him. We needed a driver who knew Eastern Maine, the Bay Harbor area. Keenan and I went to see him and laid it out for him. He liked it. I did time with him in the shank, I said. I liked him. You couldn't help but like him. He was dumb, but he was a good kid. He needed a keeper more than a partner. George and Lenny, Sarge sneered. Good to know you spent your own jail time improving what passes for your mind, sweetheart, I said. We were thinking about a bank in Lewiston. He couldn't wait for me to finish doping it out. So now he's underground. Cheapers, this really is sad, Sarge said. I'm getting like all soft and mushy inside. I picked up the gun and showed him the muzzle. And for a second or two, he was the bird and it was the snake. One more rise crack and I'll put a bullet in your belly. Do you believe that? His tongue flickered in and out with a starling quickness, lapped across his lower lip and disappeared again. He nodded. Keenan was frozen. He looked like he wanted to wretch, but didn't quite dare. He told me it was a big time, a big score, I resumed. That's all I could get out of him. He took off on April 3rd. Two days later, four guys knock over the Portland Banger Federated truck just outside of Carmel. All three guards dead. The newspaper said the robbers ran two roadblocks and a souped up 78 Plymouth. Barney had a 78 up on the blocks, thinking about turning into a stalker. I'm betting Keenan put up the front money for him to turn into something a little better and a lot faster. Looks like we got someone waiting here. I looked at him. Keenan's face was the color of cheese. On May 6th, I get a card postmarked Bar Harbor. That doesn't mean anything. There are dozens of little islands that channel their mail through there. A mailboat does the circuit, picks it up. The card says, mom and family fine, store doing good. See you in July. It was signed with Barney's middle name. I leased a cottage on the coast because Barney knew that would be the deal. July comes and goes, no Barney. I looked at him remotely. He showed up in early August, courtesy of your buddy Keenan, Sarge. He forgot about the automatic bilge pump in the boat. You thought the chop would sink it quick enough, right, Keenan? But you thought he was dead, too. I had a yellow blanket spread out on Frenchman's Point every day, visible for miles, easy to spot. Still, he was lucky. Too lucky, Sarge almost spat. One thing I'm curious about, did he know before the job that the money was new, all the serial numbers recorded, that you couldn't even sell it to a currency junker in the Bahamas for three or four years? He knew, the Sarge rumbled, and I was surprised to find myself believing him. And nobody was planning to junk the dough. He knew that too, kid. I think he was counting on that Lewiston job you mentioned for ready cash, but whatever he was or wasn't counting on, he knew the score and he said he could live with it. Why not? Say we had to wait 10 years to go back for that dough and split it up. What's 10 years to a kid like Barney? He would have had all 35. I'd be 61. What about Cappy McFarland? Did Barney know about him too? Yeah, Cappy came with a deal. A good man. A pro. He got cancer last year. Inoperable. And he owed me a favor. So the four of you went out to Cappy's Island, I said. A little nobody on it named Carmen's Folly. Cappy buried the money and made a map. That was part of Jagger's idea, Sarge said. We didn't want to split the hot money, too tempting, but we didn't want to leave all the swag in one pair of hands either. Cappy McFarlane was the perfect solution. Tell me about the map. I thought we'd get to that, Sarge said with a wintry smile. Don't tell him, Keenan cried out hoarsely. Sarge turned to him and gave him a look that would have melted bar steel. Shut up. I can't lie and I can't stonewall thanks to you. You know what I hope, Keenan? 
I hope you weren't really looking forward to seeing the new century. Your name's in a letter, Keenan said wildly. If anything happens to me, your name's in a letter. Cappy made a good mat, the Sarge said, as if Keenan were not there at all. He had some draftsman training in Joliet. He cut it into quarters, one for each of us. We were going to have a reunion on July 4th, five years later. Talk it over. Maybe decide to wait another five years. Maybe decide to put the pieces together right then. There's trouble. Yes, I said. I guess that's one way of putting it. If it makes you feel any better, it was not all Keenan's play. I don't know if Barney knew it or not, but that's how it was. When Jagger and I took off in Cappy's boat, Barney was fine. You're a liar, Keenan squealed. Who's got two pieces of the map in his wall safe? Sarge inquired. Is it you, dear? He looked at me again. It was still all right. Half the map still wasn't enough. And am I going to sit here and say I would have preferred a four-way split to a three-way? I don't think you'd believe it even if it was true. Then guess what? Keenan calls. Tells me we ought to have a talk. I was expecting it. Looks like you were too. I nodded. Keenan had been easier to find than the Sarge. He kept a higher profile. I could have tracked Sarge all the way down eventually, I suppose, but I've been pretty sure that that wouldn't be necessary. Thieves of a feather flock together, and the feathers have a tendency to fly too, when one of the birds is a vulture like Keenan. Of course, Sarge went on. He tells me not to get any lethal ideas. He says he's taken out of an insurance policy, my name in an open in event of my death letter he'd send to his lawyer. His idea was the two of us could probably dope out where Cappy'd bury the money if we put three of the four pieces of the map together. And split the swag 50-50, I said. Sarge nodded. Keenan's face was like a moon drifting somewhere in the high stratosphere of terror. Where's the safe? I asked him. Keenan didn't say anything. I had done some practicing with the 45. It was a good gun. I liked it. I held it in both hands and shot Keenan in the forearm, just below the elbow. The Sarge didn't even jump. Keenan fell off the couch and curled up in a ball, holding his arm and howling and howling. The safe, I said. Keenan continued to howl. I'll shoot you in the knee, I said. I don't know from personal experience, but I've heard that hurts a lot more. The print, he gasped. The Van Gogh. Don't shoot me anymore, huh? He looked at me, grinning fearfully. I motioned to Sarge with a gun. Stand facing the wall. The Sarge got up and looked at the wall, arms dangling limply. Now you, I said to Keenan, go open the safe. I'm bleeding to death, Keenan moaned. I went over and stroked the butt of the 45 up the side of his cheek, laying back skin. Now you're bleeding, I told him. Go open the safe or you'll bleed more. Keenan got up, holding his arm and blubbering. He took the print off its hooks with, a good, with his good hand, revealing an office gray wall safe. He threw a terrified glance at me and began to twiddle the dial. He made two false starts and had to go back. The third time, he got it open. There were some documents and two wads of bills inside. He reached in, fumbled around, and came up with two squares of paper, about three inches on a side. I swear I didn't mean to kill him. I planned to tie him up and leave him. He was harmless enough. The maid would find, the maid would find him when he, she got back from her lingerie party or whatever it was she'd gone in her little Dodge Colt. And Keenan wouldn't dare poke his nose out of the house for a week. But it was like Sarge had said. He did have two. And one of them had blood on it. I shot him again, this time not in the arm. He went down like an empty laundry bag. Sarge didn't even flinch. I wasn't crapping you. Keenan jobs your friend. They were both amateurs. Amateurs are stupid. I didn't answer. I looked down at the squares and shoved them into my pocket. And neither one had an X marks the spot on it. What now? Sarge said. We go to your place. What makes you think my piece of the map is in there? I don't know. Telepathy, maybe? Besides, if it isn't, we'll go where it is. I'm in no hurry. You've got all the answers, huh? Let's go. We went back to, out to the carport. I sat in the back of the VW on the side away from him. His bulk and the size of the car made a surprise play on his part, a joke. It would take him five minutes to get turned around. Two minutes later, we were on the road. 
It was starting to snow, big sloppy flakes that clung to the windshield and turned to instant slush when they struck the pavement. It was slippery going, but there wasn't much traffic. After a half hour on Route 10, he turned off onto a secondary road. 15 minutes later, we were on a rutted dirt track with snow freighted pines staring at us on either side. Two miles along, we turned into a short, trash littered driveway. In the limited sweep of the VW's headlights, I could make out a rickety backwood shack with a patched roof and a twisted TV aerial. There was a snow covered old Ford in a gully to the left. Out in back was an, out, was an outhouse and a pile of old tires. Hernando's hideaway. Welcome to Bally's East, Sarge said, and killed the engine. If this is a con, I'll kill you. He seemed to fill three quarters of the tiny vehicle's front seat. I know that, he said. Get out. Sarge led the way up to the front door. Open it, I said. Then stand still. He opened the door and stood still. I stood still. We stood still for about three minutes, and nothing happened. The only moving thing was a fat gray squirrel that had ventured in the middle of the yard to curse us in lingua rodenta. Okay, I said, let's go in. Surprise, surprise, it was a dump. The 160 watt bulb cast a grungy glow over the whole room, leaving shadows like starved bats in the corners. Newspapers were scattered helter skelter. Drying clothes were hung on a sagging rope. In one corner, there was an ancient Zenith TV. In the opposite corner was a rickety sink and a stark, rust-stained bathtub on claw feet. A hunting rifle stood beside it. The predominant odors were feet, farts, and chili. It beats living raw, Sarge said. I could have argued the point, but I didn't. Where's your piece of the map? In the bedroom. Let's go get it. Not yet. He turned around slowly, his dipped in concrete face hard. I want your word you ain't going to kill me when you get it. How, how are you going to make me keep it? I don't know. I guess I'm just going to hope it was more than money that got you cranked up. If it was Barney too, wanting to clean Barney's slate, you did it. It's clean. Keenan capped him and now Keenan's dead. If you want the bundle too, okay. Maybe three quarters will be enough. And you were right. My piece has got a great big X on it. But you don't get it unless you promise I get something too. My life. How do I know you won't come after me? But I will, Sonny, the Sarge said softly. I laughed. All right, throw in Jagger's address and you've got your promise. I'll keep it too. The Sarge shook his head slowly. You don't want to play with Jagger, fella. Jagger will eat you up. I had dropped the 45 a little. Now I lifted it again. All right. He's in Coleman, Massachusetts, a ski lodge. Is that good enough? Yes. Let's get your piece, Sarge. The Sarge looked me over once more closely. Then he nodded. We went into the bedroom. More colonial charm. The stained mattress on the floor was littered with stroke books and the walls were papered with photographs of women who appeared to be wearing nothing but a thin coating of Wesson oil. One look at this place and Dr. Ruth's head would have exploded. The Sarge didn't hesitate. He picked up the lamp on the night table and pried the base off it. His quarter of the map was neatly rolled up inside. He held it out wordlessly. Throw it, I invited. The Sarge smiled thinly. Cautious little pencil neck, aren't you? I find it pays. Give it up, Sarge. He tossed it over to me. Easy come, easy go, he said. I'm going to keep my promise, I said. Consider yourself lucky, out in the other room. Cold light flickered in his eyes. What are you going to do? See that you stay in one place for a while. Move. We went out into the main room, a nifty little parade of two. The Sarge stood underneath the naked light bulb, back to me, his shoulders hunched, anticipating the gun barrel that was going to groove his head very shortly. I was just lifting the gun to clout him when the light blinked out. The shack was suddenly pitch black. I threw myself to the right. Sarge was already gone like a cool breeze. I could hear the thump and tumble of newspapers as he hit the floor in a flat dive. Then silence, utter and complete. I waited for my night vision, but when it came, it was no help. The place was a mausoleum in which a thousand dim tombstones loomed, and the Sarge knew every one of them. I knew about Sarge. 
Material on him hadn't been hard to spade up. He'd been a Green Beret in Vietnam, and no one even bothered with his real name anymore. He was just Sarge, big and murderous and tough. Somewhere in the dark, he was moving in on me. He must have known the place like the back of his hand, because there wasn't a sound, not a squeaking board, not a foot scrape. But I could feel him getting closer and closer, flanking from the left or the right, or maybe pulling a tricky one and coming in straight ahead. The stock of the gun was very sweaty in my hand, and I had to control the urge to fire it wildly, randomly. I was very aware that I had three quarters of the pie in my pocket. I didn't bother wondering why the lights had gone out, not until the powerful flashlight stabbed in through the window, sweeping the floor in a wild, random pattern that just happened to catch the Sarge, frozen in a half crouch seven feet to my left. His eyes glowed greenly in the bright cone of light, like cat's eyes. He had a glinting razor blade in his right hand, and I suddenly remembered the way his hand had been spidering up his coat label in Keenan's carport. The Sarge said one word into the flash beam, Jagger? I don't know who got him first. A large, caliber pi a large caliber pistol fired once behind the flashlight beam, and I pulled the trigger of Barney's 45 twice, pure reflex. The Sarge was thrown back against the wall with force enough to knock him out of one of his boots. The flashlight snapped off. I fired one shot at the window, but only hit glass. I lay on my side in the darkness and realized that I hadn't been the only one waiting around for Keenan's greed to resurface. Jagger had been waiting too. And although there were 12 rounds of ammunition back in my car, there was only one left in my gun. You don't want to play with Jagger, fella, the sergeant said. Jagger will eat you up. I had a pretty good picture of the room in my head now. I got up in a, in a crouch and ran, stepping over Sarge's sprawled legs and into the corner. I got into the bathtub and poked my eyes up over the edge. There was no sound, none at all. The bottom of the tub was gritty with flaked off bathtub ring. I waited. About five minutes went by. It seemed like five hours. Then the light flicked on again, this time in the bedroom window. I ducked my head when it glared through the doorway. It probed briefly and clicked off. Silence again. A long, loud silence. On the dirty surface of Sarge's porcelain bathtub, I saw everything. Keenan, grinning desperately. Barney, with the clotted hole in his gut, due east of his navel. Sarge, standing frozen in the flashlight beam, holding the razor blade professionally between thumb and, fish and first finger. Jagger, Jagger, the dark shadow with no face, and me, the fifth quarter. Suddenly, there was a voice just outside the door. It was soft and cultured, almost womanish, but not a fet. It sounded deadly and competent as hell. Hey, beautiful. I kept quiet. He wasn't getting my number without dialing a little. When the voice came again, it was by the window. I'm going to kill you, beautiful. I came to kill them, but you'll do fine. A pause while he shifted position once more. When the voice came again, it came from the window just over my head, the one above the bathtub. My guts crawled into my throat. If he flashed that light now, no fifth wheels need apply, Jagger said. Sorry. I could barely hear him moving to his next position. It turned out to be back to the doorway. I've got my quarter with me. You want to come and take it? I felt an urge to cough and repressed it. Come and get it, beautiful. His voice was mocking. The whole pie. Come and take it away. But I didn't have to, and I suppose he knew it. I was holding the chips. I could find the money now. With his single quarter, Jagger had no chance. This time, the silence really spun out. A half hour, an hour, forever. Eternity squared. My body started to stiffen. Outside, the wind was tuning up, making it impossible to hear anything but rattling snow against the walls. It was very cold. The tips of my fingers were going numb. Then, around 1.30, a ghostly stirring sound like crawling rats in the darkness. I stopped breathing. Somehow, Jagger had got in. He was right in the middle of the room. Then I got it. Rigor mortis, hurried by the cold, was rearranging Sarge for the last time.
That was all. I relaxed a little. That was when the door rammed open and Jagger charged through, ghostly invisible in a mantle of white snow, tall and loose and gangling. I let him have it and the bullet punched a hole through the side of his head. And in the brief gun flash, I saw that what I had hold was a scarecrow with no face, dressed in some farmer's thrown out pants and shirt. The burlap head fell off the broomstick neck as it hit the floor. Then Jagger was shooting at me. He was holding a semi-automatic pistol and the innards of the bathtub were like a great percussive hollow symbol. Porcelain flew up, bounced off the wall and struck my face. Wood splinters and a single hot spent slug rained down on me. Then he was charging, never letting up. He was going to shoot me in the tub like a fish in a barrel. I couldn't even put my head up. It was Sarge who saved me. Jagger stumbled over one big dead foot, staggered and pummeled bullets into the floor instead of my head. Then I was on my knees. I pretended I was Roger Clemens. I pegged Barney's big 45 at his head. The gun hit him, but didn't stop him. I stumbled over the rib of the tub, getting out to tackle him, and Jagger put two groggy shots to my left. The faint silhouette stepped back, trying to get a bead, one hand holding his ear where the gun had hit him. He shot me through the wrist, and a second shot ripped a groove in my neck. Then, incredibly, he stumbled over Sarge's feet again and fell backward. He brought the gun up again and put one through the roof. It was his last chance. I kicked the gun out of his hand, hearing the wet wood sound of breaking bones. I kicked him in the groin, doubling him up. I kicked him again, this time in the back of the head, and his feet rattled a fast, unconscious tattoo on the floor. He was as good as dead then, but I kicked him again and again, kicked him until there was nothing but pulp and strawberry jam, nothing anyone could ever identify, not by teeth, not by anything. I kicked him until I couldn't swing my leg anymore and my toes wouldn't even move. I suddenly realized I was screaming and there was no one to hear me but dead men. I wiped my mouth and knelt over Jagger's body. He had been lying about his quarter of the map, as it turned out. It didn't surprise me much. No, I take that back. It didn't surprise me at all. My heap was just where I had left it, around the block from Keenan's house, but now it was just a ghostly hump of snow. I had left Sarge's VW a mile back. I hoped my heater was still working. I was numb all over. I got the door open and winced a little as I sat down inside. The crease in my neck had already clotted over, but my wrist hurt like hell. The starter cranked for a long time, and the motor finally caught. The heater was working, and the one wiper cleared away most of the snow on the driver's side. Jagger had been lying about his quarter, and it hadn't been in the unobtrusive and probably stolen hot and cynic he'd come in. But his address had been in his wallet. And if I actually needed his quarter, I thought there was a pretty good chance I could find it. I didn't think I would, but three pieces should be enough, especially since Sarge's quarter was the one with the X. I pulled out carefully. I was going to be careful for a long time. The Sarge had been right about one thing. Barney had been a dope. The fact that he'd also been my friend didn't matter anymore. The debt had been paid. In the meantime, I had a lot to be careful for. That was The Fifth Quarter by Stephen King. See, some people have come in and out, but that's okay. I know. Hopefully there's some people watching at home now. Um, I'll, it's kind of tough to to see people coming in and out and for me to let them in while I'm reading, but I've been trying to keep an eye on that. So I'll grab another water and we can start another one. Very glad I came prepared for this. I was not prepared for how much energy that took. I appreciate the different voices. Yeah, that's what I was, I was going for. Yeah. I feel like uh, it kind of it evolved a little bit over the course of the story. Mm -hmm. So this next one that we have is just a collection of the best American short stories. Uh, it's from 2011, but a great short story is a great short story. Um, both of these books 
for anyone that's interested, there's, I mean, I don't know if you're seeing the, the mirrored view or if you're seeing the straight down view, but uh, this is the best American short stories 2011. And Stephen King one that I was just reading is called Nightmares and Dreamscapes, both available at the Joliet Public Library, Ottawa Street location, perhaps the Black Road location. I haven't actually checked catalog, but definitely at the Ottawa Street location. So if anybody's interested in what we've been reading, definitely check those out. Let me grab another water because I know I'm going to need it. All right, it looks like we have about 20 minutes left. Definitely get at least one more in, maybe two. We'll see how that goes. What was the one, a good one in here? Okay, this is a pretty good one. Uh, not as long as the Stephen King one, so we might be able to squeeze another one in here. But uh, this one is called To the Measures Fall. It's by Richard Powers, and it initially appeared in The New Yorker, which uh, usually has some really good short fiction. So this is probably going to be no different. So To the Measures Fall. First read through. You are biking through the Cotswolds when you come across the thing. Spring of 63. 21 years old in your junior year abroad at the University of York after a spring term green with Chaucer, Milton, Byron, and Swinburne. Year one of a life newly devoted to words. Your recent change, of course, has crushed your father. He long hoped that you would follow through on that Kennedy inspired dream of community service. You, who might have become a first-rate social worker, you who might have done good things for the species, or at least for the old neighborhood. But life will be books for you from here on. Nothing has ever felt more preordained. Turns out it's time to see every square mile of this island. Bicycle clips, blue guide, a transistor radio, and skin-hugging rain. Villages slip past on valley roads as twisty as the clauses in Henry James. The book turns up in a junk shop in an old Saxon market town whose name you will remember as almost certainly having an M in it. Among the rusted baby buggies and ancient radios, you find old cooking magazines, books on fly tying and photography, late 50s spy novels with cardboard covers worn as soft as felt. The thing pops out at you to the measures fall by someone named Elton Wentworth. There's nothing else like it in the shop. It's a fat tome with rough cut pages and a deluxe tool binding. The dust jacket has disappeared, but the front matter suggests that you know all about Mr. Wentworth already. Born in 1888, the author of 12 previous books and the winner of awards too numerous to mention. The first line reads, a freak snow hit late that year, two weeks after the San Martins returned to the gravel pits near the South Downs. The next few paragraphs sketch out a hard-pressed town, watton on wold much like the one you are in, with the M in it. On page three, the author reveals the date, 1913. On the last page, a village search party finds the body of a young amputee captain who served at the Somme lying at the bottom of said gravel pits. Only seven years have passed, but the lilting open cadences have darkened into fragments from another world. The book seems to be a sweeping portrait of rural England before and after the First World War. You check, you check the title page, copyright 1948. Aside from two bold exclamation points at the end of chapter one, the pages are unblemished, perhaps unread. Penciled into the upper right hand of the inside front is a price, 10 pounds, exorbitant. You draw seven pounds a week for student expenses. A three course Chinese dinner on Station Road costs four shillings and lunch in the canteen is half that. A 12-inch LP runs only a pound, 
And even a two minute call to the States is cheaper than Mr. Wentworth's book. Half a guinea for a used novel you've never heard of? Robbery. But something about that opening is too strange for you to resist. Besides, you've just devoted your life to literature. You graze the start of chapter two in which Trevor, a spindly farmer's son with Addison's disease, baffles his parents by insisting on going to university. You need to know how this beginning can reach so macabre an end. The shop's owner is a beaked old man with a gray hairline like a cow si slipping off its head. It's humiliating to bargain with him, but you're desperate. How much do you offer the junk store owner for his used book? You are, by the way, female. Lots of folks think you shouldn't be out biking alone, even in the Cotswolds. See pages 214 to 223 of Mr. Wentworth's epic. How much would you have offered for the book had you been male? You buy the book, lug it around on the rest of the bike tour, drag it back up north with you, but somehow fail to read it. When summer ends, and with it your English idol, you've shocked to discover how many essential novels you've bought and haven't got around to reading. Now the problem is packing them all into a suitcase that is lighter than 44 pounds. You could mail them to the States, but they'd cost more to ship than you spent to buy them. You resort to the time-honored system of three piles, keep for all time, suspend in purgatory, or cast forever into the outer darkness. By the evening before the homeward flight, to the measure's fall is stuck stubbornly in purgatory, along with Wheelock's What is Poetry, James Purdy's Malcolm, The Bull from the Sea, by Mary Renault, John Brain's bestseller Life at the Top, and Updike's The Centaur which has got mixed reviews. Life at the top might be tricky to get hold of in the States. Who knows how long Updike will be read. Malcolm, on the other hand, is already on every undergraduate syllabus in the country. Renault, guilty pleasure, is the one you'd really love to have in your carry-on. The further adventures of the Thesus and Hippolyta with, trench, with sun-drenched temples, earthquakes, and human god miscegenation. How better to fill eight hours of captive reading but your bag will hold only four more volumes. You must choose which two books will get dumped forever. Wentworth makes the cut, if only as a souvenir of that magical cycling tour. Weirdly, browsing through the bookshop in the Oceanic Terminal at Heathrow, you notice a reprint of one of his earlier novels about coal miners in Wales. It's a penguin with that orange spine that's synonymous with great books. There's a jacket blurb from Winston Churchill calling Wentworth, this island's Balzac, our much revered, much imitated national asset. And another from Dame Edith Sitwell, calling him England's most distinguished living author of the novel of community. National asset makes Wentworth sound like a hulking stone country house given away by pauperized aristocrats for tax deductions. And most distinguished feels a bit dated against the backdrop of mods, rockers, the angry young men and beyond the fringe. Still, Two immortal literary icons have praised this man to the skies. What an incredible deal, getting that first edition for eight shillings. Clearly, the balding junk shop owner didn't know what he was selling. Far out over the Atlantic, as you approach Greenland, a twinge of conscience hits you. What good is all the cultivation in the world if you use it to cheat ignorant people? How much should you have paid the shopkeeper? Exceed his proposed price, if necessary. Back in the States, you look up Elton Wentworth. He is in England's most distinguished living anything. He died right around the time that you realize you'd sooner sell cigarettes from a shoulder tray than to go into social work. In addition to keeping the Cotswolds and coal in Wales, he had Lincolnshire fishermen and three generations of Brummy factory workers. He was in England's Balzac. He was the James Missioner of the Midlands. You read the first hundred, you read the first hundred pages of To the Measure's Fall, hacking your way through the thickets of dialect. The prose can be brutally beautiful, but the semester starts. You fall in love, get deflowered, watch Kennedy die and the Beatles invade, get high to listen to Coltrane and discover Heller, Ellison, Ferlinghetti, and Bellow. Writing that flows across the, the page in huge bright swaths that you didn't know English could permit. So the First World War was a bad scene. Are we over that yet? You graduate in the spring and pack up your worldly possessions again, just as the USS Maddox fires on three patrol boats in the Gulf of Tonkin, letting Johnson widen a war in a country that, 
until recently was as fictional to you as Wentworth's South Downs. Does the book go to Goodwill, the Salvation Army, or the 25 cent pile at your graduation lawn sale? You survived two years of graduate classes, the general comprehensive test, marriage to a Faulkner guy, and a grueling 400 book special field exam on the electric complex and post-war American prose, a subject that you begin to hate long before your committee can lob the first question. All the while, there's Biafra, Black Power, the levitation of the Pentagon, back-to-back -back assassinations, the siege of Chicago, street warfare, and city centers burning in an annual summer ritual. Drugs are everywhere, making people see God or murder their families. Books go surreal, psychedelic, and sometimes you just wonder whether they're causing the mayhem or just profiting from it. The dissertation, Your Baggy Monster, becomes a four-year excuse to read everything except those writers you threaten to write about. On a hot June Thursday, early in the new decade, right around the time when five men break into the DNC headquarters in DC, you find yourself patrolling your own shelves like a hopeful bidder at an estate sale. It's a shock to come across that deluxe binding, which you, distinct, you distinctly remember throwing out a long time ago, the Cotswolds' cruel joke. You take it down and browse. You stop to fix dinner for your husband, who, an invalid of high modernism, cannot fix it for himself. But you're back at Wentworth until 4 a.m., when you end up at the bottom of the South Downs gravel pit, 1920, your throat feeling as if you've been taking swabs at it with pipe cleaner. You don't know what hurts more, the swirling moral turbulence of the book or the belated discovery that everything you thought about it was wrong. You missed it all. Register, mood, irony, ambiguity, subtleties of characterization, narrative arc, even basic plot points. You can't read. It's like finding out at 30 that you're adopted. You're not yet sure that it's great literature, but the thing took you underwater and held you there for the better part of 13 hours and two days later, you're still winded. It's single, history slap village is a whole world whose heft and weight and strange, sinuous tangle of syntax stands for nothing but itself. Its portraits, particularly that of Sarah, the mother of the doomed Captain Trevor and furtive wife of idealism-scarred Francis Beck, seem to clearly rip from the microscope, microscopic observation that it's cheating to call them fiction. This story is not your life. It's not your time or place. It's just a scrap of torn diary floating up from a scorched pass. What does the thing want from you? You give the book a final grade. Fail. You make your husband read it. This is a mistake, as he reads it way too fast. Very well done, he reports, wanting his sugar cube. Skillful, first-rate social realism. Why haven't more people written about this guy? It isn't skillful. It isn't social realism. You read it again, taking a week this time. Now the book gets more troubling, more weirdly allegorical. You can't put your finger on what bothers you. Something to do with hoping against your better judgment. You lie awake on a hot August night, wondering how a thing might be good and real and true for a while, then made irrelevant or worse by later events. You've got very close with your thesis advisor. In fact, if you remember right, you're sleeping with him. The two of you are in an actual bed somewhere, in the dark, a luxury you can no longer imagine how you managed. Maybe it's an OPEC oil crisis thing. Turn off the lights when not in use. The two of you are playing that old favorite. Which classic would you never dare admit to anyone but your lover in the dark that you haven't read? You offer Silas Laphane, and he ups the ante to Billy Budd, and you try to trump with the sound and the fury which he blows out of the water with Huck Finn. You ask him if he's ever read any Wentworth. He just snickers, thinking it another game. You obsess over the thing. You read all the criticism. Most of it damns itself with due diligence. Trevor Beck and Erickson's theory of psychological development, wool, surplus value, and class unrest in Wentworth's Watton world. No article has an insight strong enough to explain why you should be reading it rather than the book again. You learn all kinds of things about Elton Wentworth, some of which you wish you hadn't. Blacklisted for pacifist activity under the Defense of the Realm Act, went to Russia between the wars and came back extolling the enlightened social state. 
right up until Munich, a prominent appeaser. But come September 1939, he turned British super patriot and, and personal propagandizer for Churchill, which helped explain the latter's jacket blurb. After the war, he fought decolonization tooth and nail in a series of interviews with dozens of natives on three continents who all declared the British Empire the best thing to ever happen to its colonial subjects. At the age of 81, he was jailed for three months for participating in violent demonstrations against nuclear weapons. In short, the author of the autonomous, ungrudging, unjudging book with no villains and fewer heroes in which every moral position is plausible but flawed was himself a hopeless, card-carrying, repeat-offending true believer. Great Elton Wedworth's public performance, separate marks for form, style, and intent. In one of Wentworth's biographies, you come across a photograph of a note to Wentworth from Sir Winston himself. The letter's signature vaguely resembles the ink scrawl that you've never paid attention to. On the inside front cover of your copy, underneath the penciled price that now fills you with shame. The signature in the reproduced, in the reproduced note reads Winnie. The drooping, obscured squiggle in your copy looks more like hump hump clunlunk. You are insane, of course hallucinating from over-research. There is no way on any likely earth that a book belonging to one of the century's most famous personages could end up in a junk shop in the Cotswolds. Winston Churchill, Nobel laureate in literature, wasn't about to write his name in his bloody books. If found, please return to the House of Commons, London. You try to erase the pencil price for a better look, but you succeed only in smearing the signature. You look up every occurrence of Churchill's signature on record in the university's library. There is a similarity. The book gives you nothing else to go on except the two bold exclamation points at the end of the first chapter. The one on the right seems distinctly Churchillian. You take the book to an appraiser, but you get paranoid. This is exactly the kind of scenario in which the naive get bilked. On your next trip to the city, you show it to an antiquarian whom you've bought for many times. He listens to your theory with a tight, embarrassed smile. He says that even if you did get the signature certified, which would cost considerable blood, toil, tears, and sweat, the simple signature without any further marginalia might not greatly increase the book's value. Given the dicey nature of the scribble, you may not want to pay for appraisal, but he's willing to give you $50 for the copy for a good customer. 50 bucks could buy two years of used novels, deal or no deal. You keep the copy for reasons that reason don't understand. But two and a half months later, you wipe out, you wipe out on still no diss. Your husband says no kids until you finish, but you can't finish. The thesis isn't even embarrassing. Psychoanalytic readings reek of six years ago, and this new post-structural stuff gives you hides. You crash and burn. The house goes to pot. You glue yourself to the Watergate hearings for weeks. The whole mad circus is like a Dickens serial saga. You talk to the screen, cheering and hissing. You even develop a little thing for Sam Irvin. You get a job adjuncting at a nearby college, intros and surveys. But drumming up enthusiasm for Wharton and Cather is murder. These days, it's all Pynchon and Bartholomew, Coover and Gaddis and Gas. The cannon goes up in smoke. You realize, belatedly, that you're a co-opted, false consciousness servant of empire, a capo of privileged, heteronormative white paternalism, but it's too late to retool. Around the fall of Saigon, plagued by those films of people on the embassy rooftop clutching the runners of escaping helicopters, you bail out into law school. It's the only practical choice. And doesn't law, at bottom, involve the same act of eternal verbal negotiation as reading? The marriage breaks up under the pressure of one out. Your only recreational reading for the next two years is, con is the congressional record. You get a good job with a decent boutique firm specializing in intellectual property. None of your dozens of bright, well-read colleagues have ever heard of Wanton on Wold. You marry again, this time for real, to a big police procedural fan in corporate litigation. At the last possible moment, you have kids, three of them one reader and two watchers who get their ABCs from purple and green televised puppets. Nothing will ever light up the cortex faster than cathode rays. Yet with your reader daughter, the whole awful gut-wrenching seduction 
happens all over again. Urban ducklings, wild things, purple crayons, it doesn't matter. Your daughter, glazed eyed and body snatched, chants, read mommy, read, like she's off in Neverland already, but even before the first verb. And you, fallen Wendy, eviscerated by the eternal recurrence of it all, hear Peter snarl at you for growing guilty and big and old, while something inside you cries, woman, woman, let go of me. A few years pass, and still your daughter is reading furiously. You'll lose her eventually to the rising flood of film, the swelling archive of video that offers new republics of visual democracy. Who knows how long the page will hold her attention? Do you rush her in the good stuff while you can? Maybe, if you time things right, the whole crumbling Edwardian stage set of Wanton on Wold will strike her as some kind of hyper Narnia. Your children become the heroes of their own plots, time worn narratives and unrecognizable new bindings. The 80s pass while your energies are spent elsewhere on building up the college tuition war chests, on making partner, on helping companies copyright common English words. You still read for pleasure, all kinds of things. The hunger remains, but the costumes must grow ever more elaborate to produce the same transport. You're caught somewhere between reading for recognition and reading for estrangement. Mostly what you read are reviews. Too few hours left to do more than scan the books that you know you'd love. At least you can read what the gatekeepers say about this fall's lineup. And often, imagining a book from its synopsis beats what you do manage to slog through. The reviews accumulate faster than you can flip through them. What you really need is a thumbnail summary of the thumbnail summaries. A year or so after Granada or Iran Contra or some such thing, while blasting through last year's stack of unread literary weeklies prior to pitching them, you, can't, you come across the fact that to the measures fall, long out of print, is being, reissued, is being reissued in an annotated essential library edition, part of a general renaissance of Wentworth, who, the review laments, has been in a 20-year decline. The reviewer calls measures the once celebrated, now forgotten British magic mountain. He claims that Wentworth's wartime Midlands still have as much to reveal as any of the marginalized regions of the earth. Can that possibly include Lebanon, the Punjab? The retrospective appreciation feels like one of those lifetime achievement awards that you get for having the courtesy to stay dead. The new cover for the Essential Library Edition is dazzling. It makes Wentworth look like the next Alice Walker. You're not sure what constitutes a decent interval between much revered national asset and unfairly undervalued. For the reviewer, the revival proves the one universal truth about literary merit. Quality will surface in the run of time. The trick is to stop time at just the right moment. New annotated editions flood the market. Does your boat go up? You break down and pay an appraiser 10 times what you would have 10 years ago to look at your copy. Churchill's marked up volume, it turns out, went for 800 pounds, just as the new Wentworth went Renaissance hit. Your copy belonged to a Cotswold sheep farmer named H.H. Cleanleach. The appraiser offers you 10 bucks off his fee. The boys in information processing install a terminal in your office that fills your old dream. Rapid access to abstracts of all the articles that you can no longer find time to read. In between researching briefs, you follow the boomlet in Wentworth studies. The reader response people take him up than those who study reputational revision. There's a minor heyday in swarming any author still in the state of pre-post exhaustion just before the idea of single author studies gives out. A modernist at New Mexico State proves that To the Measures Fall was really written around 1928 suppressed by Wentworth for two decades, then published, despite his objections, in a form he didn't want. A Bernard associate professor proves that half the novel was the work of Wentworth's longtime mistress. A graduate student at Indiana proves that the book is riddled with historical error. Scholars of all ranks show how Wentworth was the product of a thousand horrific cultural blindness and Eurocentric brutalities. The Berlin Wall falls, and the evil empire falls with it. The Cold War ends, and for a moment, history does too. You stop reading anything that is more than two months old. You don't exactly remember the 90s, the Gulf, of course, something about Somalia, smoke everywhere, lots of colored ribbons tied around America's trees. The firm keeps dangling the promise of senior partnership, but it never quite happens. The 1993 feature film adaptation of To the Measures Fall stars Daniel Day-Lewis and Emma Thompson. There's an extended hallucinatory sequence depicting the suicidal slow walk at the Somme. 
graphically matched to a torrid sex scene on the, hel on the heath outside Watson on Wold. A tie in paperback edition appears, with a glossy movie still covering the gorgeous leads. On your 55th birthday, the age at which the terminally ill Sarah Beck must identify her son's body at the foot of the South Downs gravel pit, you join a book group. The kids are grown, the career is on autopilot, the husband is off playing paintball, and it's time to read again. Books are back, in more flavors than ever. Cool books, slick books, innovative remixes, massive doorstops, caustic family sagas from Kazakhstan. Books in every market niche and biome. Back too is the long dead art of communal reading. Okay, maybe a few of your book group members are in it for the finger food, but you've forgotten what a pleasure it is to discuss out loud. Aimless talk about love and lust, responsibility, hope, and pain. Together, over two years, you read the major national selections. Your fellow members bring their old secret freight out of deep storage. You take nine months to work up your request. You're just unsure of your friends, unsure of your ability to reread, unsure of just what's in that treacherous book these days. You read it slowly this time, a chapter a night, over the course of weeks. This time, though, the book is no more than a grand, futile gesture of nevertheless in the face of human frailty. Francis Beck's refusal to believe that his wife is ill, a feckless, coward, a feckless cowardice that turns, by insistent, almost heroic. Alice writes paralyzing premonition, which she can't act upon without destroying the man who would destroy her. Trevor's premeditated signal to Alice, ready to launch itself from beyond the grave. Two club members report flinging the book across the room in a rage. Another demands her three days back. Accusations multiply. It's cerebral, it's meandering, it's manipulative. It's cold and cunning and misanthropic. It's wrecked by redemption. How are we supposed to care about the characters? I just wanted them all to get a life. But a few people in the group don't know what hit them. One friend hated the first 50 pages but wanted 50 more after the end. The quietest man in the group comes back from Wanton Unwold wrapped in brittle bewilderment at his own existence. It's a custom of the group, introduced by the male minority, to assign every book a letter grade. Yours gets a C+. Plus. Overnight, the World Wide Web weaves tightly around you. A novelty at first, then invaluable, then life support, then heroin. It's a chance to recapture everything you've ever lost. College friends, out of print rarities, quotations that had vanished forever. Your online hours must come from somewhere and it isn't from your TV viewing. You lose whole days on the roller coaster of real time eBay auctions. Volumes of Wentworth go off at every price from triple digits down to a buck 99. You rescue a few to give friends, to give to friends someday or whatever. It thrills you to discover a site where all the shameless Wentworth readers in the world gather to post their guilty pleasures. You subscribe to a feed. Six months later, the community spirals into a civil war as a thread between sock puppets and anonymous avatars go up in flames. You watch the Amazon ratings for To The Measures Fall drop steadily from a high of four and a half stars to a low somewhat below that of a defective wood chipper. The wisdom of crowds means to send Wentworth into a third and final eclipse. You consider logging in at the comfort suites across the country, creating all kinds of persona, personas to rescue the book for another generation of Wentworth readers whenever they dare to come out of hiding. Then the new century. Terror and sci-fi becomes life dominant genres. War turns perpetual. The last print newspapers head toward extinction. More words get posted in five years than were published in all previous history. Global warming threatens to flood coast inhabited by half a billion people. Most of the planet suffers from drought or tainted water. Two months before you plan to retire, you learn that you have a massive tumor nestled up in the stern of your lungs where nothing can reach it. It's right where Sarah Bex is, if you're imagining correctly. Your daughter, the reader, brings you the book to keep you company in a state-of-the-art cancer center. In your bed next to a window that looks out into a brick wall 10 feet across a cement courtyard. You read it again. Not the whole book, of course. You couldn't possibly read a whole anything. But you manage a few pages, searching for a creature that recedes in front of your gaze. This time, the book is about shifting delusion of the shared need, our imprisonment in a medium as traceless as air. 
It's about a girl who knew nothing at all, taking a bike ride through the Cotswolds one ridiculous spring, mistaking books for life and those roiling hills of metaphor for truth. It's about a little flash, glimpsed for half a paragraph at the bottom of a left-hand page, that fills you with something almost like knowing. A freak snow hits late that year. You lie in bed, an hour from your next morphine dose, your swollen index finger marking a secret place in the spine-cracked volume. The passage that predicted your life. For a moment, you are lucid and equal to any story. Score the world on a scale from one to ten. Say what you'd like to see happen in the sequel. And that is that. I really did like that one. Uh, there was a few I could have chosen from, and I thought that was one of the best ones. So again, this is from the Best American Short Stories 2011, available at the Julia Public Library. Uh, that is a story from the New Yorker who I have found have really, really good short stories available on their website. So I would check that out as well. Uh, but it looks like we went a little over time here. So oh, it looks like there were some people trying to get in and couldn't make it. Well, the good thing is that we are recording this, so this will be available for anyone who wants to watch it. Um, thank you for coming. Seems to be you were the only one that stuck around. Uh, Thanks for reading. Oh, no problem. Um, depending on how popular this gets, after it's recorded, if people have enough interest, we might be doing this again. Uh, but again, I encourage everybody to check out the two books we read. Again, Best American Short Stories 2011. And Nightmares and Dreamscapes by Stephen King, which are both available at the library, at least the Ottawa Street branch, if not both. And yeah, thanks for coming. We'll see you next time.